Uh, good morning and welcome to the 2013 Linux conference. Um, this is the first speaker of the morning. Um, it's Andy Fitzsimmons and the title is Think, Create and Crit Critique Design. Andy describes himself as a designer, geek and friend. Um, he works as a senior user experience designer at Red Hat in Brisbane and he's used Linux from the early days of floppy dis uh, distributions. So welcome Andy and hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. That doesn't help the hangover. Uh, hi guys, uh, I'm a uh, drinker with a speaking problem. <laughs> and uh, it's flooding in Brisbane, so I had to steal the wife's Mac. So it's very unprofessional of me. You can't, hello, 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 no? Oh wow, that happened quickly. I'm gonna shout, it's all right. Yeah? Oh, it's dead. Oh, it's gone. Oh, man. You can talk. You want me to talk? Yep. Time? That's all right. All right. Uh, first rule of design. What? Hello? Am I doing it right yet? Man, this is a collaborative process. This is awesome. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, no, this is not, not, my, not my realm, but it could be if I learned how to think, create, and critique. First rule of design, if it's not a Baskerville ampersand, make it small. Uh, I'm Andy Fitz. Um, I did that so that all the letters would fit, and also so if you're from New Zealand, it pronounced the same way. Uh, you, most of you might know me from, from Inkscape. It's a project uh, that I absolutely love. I use it every day, have been for a very long time. I've got a bunch of Inkscape homies right here. So, um, you know, if you want to ask me about that, it's my passion. I work for this guy, Shadow Man. Um, yeah, so we're an operating system company. Uh, we're doing all right. Um, we're also hiring. Uh, pff, up until... This week, I was working in the cloud business unit, so that's making um, cloudy things. We have a product called CloudForms, it's an abstraction layer, fun stuff, but uh, now I'm in marketing. Haha, <laughs> 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 business. <laughs> so I'm the brand manager for APAC, fun. All right, so the first thing I want to get across is um, we're all designers, and uh, that sounds, you know, very fluffy and inclusive and warm and all of that, but we are all designers. How do you think I say this? That's, I design when I say this. When I call Brenda and I say, hey, baby, I'm at the pub, I don't say, hey, I'm at the pub. I say, hey, baby, I'm at the pub. <laughs> I'll be home, it's cool. <laughs> it's a very deliberate decision to alter my tone, to alter the texture of my voice, uh, and to make it sound like it's not a bad thing. All right, so I'm going to cover three things, and I'm, this is actually a marathon, so I should probably speed up. But we're going to run through the fundamentals of design, probably going to be a bit obvious to a lot of you, bear with me, it's always nice to have a refresher. Then we're going to go through practice, some of the things about design that I do know, uh, and then we're going to go through a bit of process stuff, which is a bit nerdy. So anyway, elements and principles of design. I could have chosen a million design fundamentals, just like there's a million ideologies, there's a million different principles and fundamentals of design. But I'm choosing this one because it's, it's pretty cool. I use it as a series of questions to ask myself uh, when I'm looking at a design, when I'm looking at a problem, just so that I know what I'm looking at. I tried to explain this to Brenda, and she said it's kind of like cooking. And I you know, asked how. Anyway, well, when you, when you use ingredients, you create flavors and they influence a meal. Salty isn't an ingredient. Salt is. The flavor it creates is saltiness. But an entire meal doesn't have to be salty, just an aspect thereof. So elements create principles influencing a composition. Pretty easy way to think about it. Ingredients are really obvious. If you look into your stew and you see a peppercorn, you know that's a peppercorn, usually. Uh, so elements are great, they're obvious. The, the raw tools, they're kind of like the thing that you know how to implement, absolutely, as a creator. Uh, they're something you can look for and not have an argument about. They're a real, they're a real thing, they're obvious. That's why I like them. Um, anyway, I'm gonna go over the terminology. Let's see. So the first one is line. 
Uh, it's a continuous path between two points. Uh, obviously, a line can be a line, you know, a couple squiggly lines up there. It can also be a process. It can also be uh, a plot when you're writing a story. It can be a contour. A line can be a lot of things. A line, uh, in the abstract sense, is still an elemental property of design. Shape, you know, when the line joins around to cover itself, it has a shape. People, people use geometric terminology to express ideas quite frequently. People might say a bottleneck. They might say um, a pyramid scheme. They might say a whole bunch of other stuff uh, using shapes as a way to explain something. Uh, and chances are, if you're, using, if you're confident enough to attribute geometry to a, to a term, you know it enough to give it that, you know, yeah, anyway. All right, so space. Uh, there's positive and negative space. Um, distance, time, lack of continuity, um, the area inside and between things, um, space, the final frontier. There's uh, size. Now size is a great thing to ask, the bigness and smallness of something. Um, uh, it's the physical scale. Color is a perceived mixture. Now color is a tricky one because we're always thinking of additive or subtractive light. Uh, but color can be, again, an emotive term. You can say green with envy, you can say red with anger, red with passion. You can use color to uh, describe a personality. Uh, that's a very colorful personality you have. You know, that is uh, an elemental term. So anyway, that's, uh, that's a, a nice uh, elemental thing. Now look, value. Value is not the slider. It's uh, static measures of something. So value of your volume, value of a property, value of something. So that's, um, you know, in my case, I said the lightness, richness, and volume, you know, the actual set, set value of a thing. Uh, if you are measuring something, you then know its value. So it's very hard to argue, you know, what exactly it is. Okay, so texture is another one. It's the structure and feel, uh, the roughness, the smoothness, the softness, the stickiness, the wetness, the, you know, a textural property to something is a great way to describe ideas. It's a great way to describe things that you see, that you experience, that you watch. Because if you can associate a texture to it, you know more, you know more about its syncopation, you know more about its build-up. It's, it's something that, that is a great, you know, check when you're critiquing or looking and creating design. But anyway, those were the elements of design. Um, pretty hard to argue. So when you see one, you know, you know what it is. When you say this is a line, no one's going to say, no, it's not. You know, that's, well, anyway, I'm trying to make sure that we have exact uh, terminology because arguing with designers is a very sticky thing. <laughs> Principles are a little bit trickier because um, they're the methods applied. Like I said, you know, salt creating salty what's, you know, the method. Uh, of doing something. They influence a composition, but they are not the composition. They're made with elements, but they're also made with other principles. So it's really freaking confusing. If you Google the elements and principles of design, you're going to come up with a million different variations, mostly on the principles aspect. This is mine. It may not be uh, academically accurate, but it's what I've been uh, living with and you know, not getting fired by. So proportion. Proportion is, yeah, divided measure of a relative whole. Uh, you can use proportion. Um, uh, to define whether or not something is a, a, a correct problem in the right weight. You can measure a consideration set by a proportion. You can talk about uh, how much something is in proportion. Proportion is uh, a pretty good thing. We're not just talking about like the golden ratio, which is, you know, a bit of a, you know, one of the many things you can apply proportion to. We're not just talking about the rule of thirds if you're into photography. A proportion is, uh, yes, just a divided measure of a relative whole. That one's kind of cool because you don't have to argue that much about it. Uh, but pattern, pattern is using the same elements multiple times, the same things really multiple times. So um, pattern is, you know, when you see something and it's repeated, it's a pattern. Uh, people use the term pattern when they're making clothes to describe the cutout, the repeatable part, the template that they use uh, to make something. A pattern is like, can you see uh, any, any, anything that you have seen before uh, in the same application somewhere else? So that's a pattern. A bit weird. Graduation. Uh, movies, songs, anything that has uh, a linear but over something else uh, type of flow, that's, uh, that's graduation. So incremental changes to one element over another. Here I've got uh, size uh, changing over distance. Uh, I've also got the shape changing. So, you know, that's a graduation. Gradients in color are also graduation. And when you leave school and go into university and then you leave university, graduation, fantastic. So 
this is the one I struggle the most with. This is the one everyone struggles with. And this, you know, the language isn't specific, so I've just added all of the terms. Balance, harmony, unity, the things that people say are cohesive, the thing that everybody seeks. They want the, you know, the symmetry of the face that people are attracted to. They want to make sure that they do things with equal consideration. Balance is that one thing that you always struggle with. But you use these terms to describe something that is in balance. Next one is contrast. Now, contrast isn't just a setting on the TV. It is an abrupt difference in one thing to another. So the contrast could be, you know, everybody was having a good time, then somebody fired it and everyone's like, uh, that's contrast. The night went from being happy until really uncomfortable. Um, contrast is uh, me before and after that um, tequila martini last night. <laughs> So anyway, emphasis. Uh, it's a significant use of one or more elements in a single place that disti two distinguishes. Oh, man. Oh, gosh. All right, anyway, my emphasis. Bam! You can tell. I've actually changed the shape, I've changed the size, and I've changed the space occupied. I've created emphasis with that little tiny dot. Master of design. Form. What you see here is four lines and three dots, but instead, you'll say circle because it's the whole that a sum of parts make. It's an easy way for us to chunk and consider and create uh, and attribute a whole to. So it's a circle. Uh, form is amazing because just, just because you made something out of a certain set of elements doesn't mean that its eventual form is going to be what you made it from. So you might make a house out of spaghetti. It's not necessarily, it's still spaghetti, but now it's a house. The form is what you would use to describe the final result. Form is deep. It is deep. There is a whole like, universe of psychology and science, everything behind it. And uh, there's a German term called Gestalt. If you Google it, that is like a minefield. You'll stay up late reading about it. Uh, it's pretty much, in a really dumb, my version is, you know, we chunk you know, so that we can understand things better. We recognize patterns so that we can understand things better. And we try and oversimplify to the point at which something is comprehensible in a short amount of time. Uh, gestalt is form and how we consider form. And that is the key to understanding the whole universe of design because it's about what you eventually create to what form it is to how it's perceived. It is this whole big thing. Anyway, so those are the principles of design. I know it's dry. It's kind of academic, kind of nerdy. Your grade four art teacher probably taught you the same stuff and you were falling asleep. So I'm sorry for having to go through that. But keep them in your mind as a list of things because you don't know what you don't know. And I use them as a checklist just so that I know what I'm talking about. They're measurable but sub subjective. I mean, the principles are. But think about it in the context of creating. You know exactly what you can do when you create. You know how to make a line. You know how to change the shape of something. You know how to change the size. These things are very easy to implement. You know, like the easy thing is, OK, I can change the color. Uh, but then the thing that it, the resulting create that it does is, does changing the color put emphasis on this? Does changing the color contrast with everything else? Uh, is there a balance? You try and check off what you're actually doing just so that you know what you're doing. Because half of design is punting. And if you're punting, you're flying blind. And that's no good. If you're appraising, it's a bit of the opposite. You go from what it's created, so whether or not you can guess a proportion, whether or not you can see a graduation, a change over time, if you can see a pattern or a balance or contrast, you then dig down into what it's made up of. So, you know, you see a curry and you're like, damn, that's good curry. But then you're like, what's that? Is that pepper? Oh, man, I can't have pepper. And that's kind of how, that's kind of, that's kind of how you appraise design. That's a terrible way of doing it, because people don't act like that in art galleries, but they should. All right, so the reason why I came over and said these are the elements and principles, serious stuff, is because you need to know uh, what exists to alter. And uh, you also need to know what impact that will have. So what elements, what can you alter? What impact change in those elements will have? What principles will be applied? And then what results to expect? So actually, you know, what form that will eventually take. With this simple syntax, this simple set of words that you can use to communicate with a designer or to communicate from your own designs. You can critique designs, images, videos, songs, poems, stories, meals, beer, sunsets, furniture, quilts, buildings, video games, and more. You absolutely can apply the same checklist to everything. It is not purely visual. It is not purely in literature. It is everything. All design speaks the same language. It is fantastic realization to have. This helps you be deliberate. This helps you know what you're doing because uh, it's not just about throwing something uh, on the page and chucking a cat picture behind it. But sometimes it is. You've got to know what matters. You've got to limit the rest. Uh, no one likes wasting too much time. No one likes flying blind. So those are the fundamentals. 
plenty of other fundamentals to choose from, I decided to rock out with those. I'm going to go into three realms uh, that have been in my uh, previous role as user experience designer, and I'll kind of cut into just some nice quick wins, because that's what most people are here for. They want to have that one takeaway and, and rock out with that. So the easiest one is um, something if you do any digital visual design, uh, something that you need to know. I did that. The Swiss one, straight up. They conquered the world. Uh, the aesthetic is ubiquitous. It is easy. It is unreal. I say Swiss design. That's a lie. The true name is the International Typographic Star. But if you say that, you Swiss call it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even Swiss, man, but they bribe me with chocolate. Now, look, if you say International Typographic Star, most people will glaze over if they haven't heard that before. Even though it literally says what it is, it is just a douchey, pretentious term. Shouldn't use it. I say Swiss design, even though it is uh, semantically wrong. Typographic, because text rules supreme. All elements and principles are influenced directly by text. Everything that you can do has been influenced by what type exists on a design. That is the great rule. There's problems with it. It's famously uh, you know, homogenous. It's um, hard to tell. These are all different band posters from a website called Swisted. You can't, you can't, <laughs> that's a great name, isn't it, Swisted? Yeah, actually the, the Google results for Swiss design aren't as good as the Google results for international typographic style if you're doing Google image search. But yeah, yeah, aside from that, I still think I'm right calling it Swiss design. <laughs> you can't tell what style of music any of these posters are unless you know the band. So it's kind of like design that doesn't get in the way, but then it's not really expressing as much as it should. Um, it's all about a lot of things. It seems simple, but it's all about geometry grids, ratios, proportions, refined palette, you know, perceived simplicity and structure. There's rules that you can follow, straight up things that you can eyeball and go, that's wrong. And that's what people love doing to designers, right? So I figured that was a good aesthetic for me to pimp to you. It's easy to critique and it's easier to implement. I'm not saying it's easy to implement, but it's easier than many things. Um, one of the rules that they have is a baseline grid. You've probably heard that a lot if you're into you know, CSS preprocessors or if you're into CSS in general. You'll have people bitching that line height isn't a baseline and all this other nonsense. Anyway, you can check stuff with a ruler. That's how easy it is. All right? There might not be a technical framework for most of it, but you can check with a ruler. The idea of a baseline is it always follows a vertical rhythm. And that's like really, really easy. It's the first thing. If you chuck anything on a canvas, if you chuck anything on a page, if your design has words and then it has multiple lines, you already have a grid. You can pretty much see how much in from the left it is, uh, how far down your two lines go, and then you've actually created the base structure for your site. It's an invisible thing, but the rule is applied the second you put anything on a canvas. So you immediately have a set of patterns and a set of tools to, and rules to follow and adhere to just to make sure that things don't look wrong. Now, that's one of those weird things. You start working away, you start changing the style of something, and then you're like, but it still looks a bit weird. Check it out. Check the grid. Make sure things are tight. You'll see things uh, shape up in no time. Uh, the, the god of typography, um, the guy who wrote uh, Elements of Typographic Style. No, the, um, that's the thing. Uh, forgetting the name of Robert's book. Anyway, he talks about a varied scale. Varied scale is where you grab one unit, one metric, and then you scale up and scale up by a set proportion, by a set ratio, by a set percentage on each object incrementally. It's how you can type, uh, it's how you can set different sizes of fonts, but it's also how you can measure things and also how you can create things. Whenever you see those things that come up with lots of circles drawn on them, generally it's because all of those circles match a certain ratio. And while that might have been done after the fact that something was designed, it doesn't mean it wasn't in the mind of the designer when they were creating it. That's why you see all of those pictures of logos with circles over them, so weird. Anyway, symbolics, they're a great tool to have because they actually follow typographic rules more than anything else. Uh, you can then appraise the placement of a glyph, uh, of a symbolic glyph, as if it is just a random glyph of text. Um, symbolics are fantastic, they're international, sometimes the visual metaphors are a bit off, but it's a fantastic tool to use, uh, just to clarify. Um, anyway, Art Nouveau. The problem with Art Nouveau is that we're not Alphonse Mucha. <laughs> he invented planking, as can be seen in this picture. <laughs> His, um, don't clap. It's not, people have died <laughs> with Darwin Awards in their hands. <laughs> Art Nouveau is ornate, it is decorated, it is highly uh, hard to create. But there's a great thing if you do try and create you know, ornate styles. And it's what Matthew Carter, the guy who designed Vedana, said. There's plenty of places to hide. And you can make mistakes. 
you can mess up a bell, a flower, a flourish, people won't really notice because there's so much crap going on. For digital visual design, it's not necessarily the best thing because you can't uh, communicate a lot of interactivity, you can't communicate uh, a lot on top of anything that's that ornamented, but it doesn't mean it's a bad aesthetic, it just means that it's hard as hell, and if you see someone pull it off, props to them. You can actually even see in this, there's core geometry that's been followed, it's a fantastic piece. Anyway. Other tools that you can use, style tiles and brand guides. Sometimes it's not about a piece. It's about the set of rules you design, the set of rules you create. Because following rules is so easy. If I dictate a set of rules, like today I am only going to use circles, you know, like I'll come up with eventually something that is made from circles, uh, you know, and I'll try my best to, to limit uh, the possibilities so that I have a constraint to, to follow. Um, a friend of mine says that a good designer can design with toothpicks, and that sounds like a pretty good uh, guide to give yourself. All right, today the toothpick has this space, this distance, this metric, it's got this many placement options. You've given yourself a set of rules, and that creates constraint will then form an aesthetic. When I mean form an aesthetic, I mean everyone's going to look like toothpicks, right? You know, but that sounds silly, but if you use the one set of measures of uh, size, proportion, color, balance, texture, shape, pattern, uh, if you just start restricting yourself to a subset, you then get uh, a really balanced piece, a really good, solid, you know, uh, style. And then, when you deliver it to somebody, you can create a style tile or a brand guide, because that's a set of rules to follow, rather than exactly what the piece should be. All right, that was visual design. There were the quick wins I've got, uh, the best I've got right now. Um, this piece, this presentation was kind of a bit, done a bit quick, but I'm going to go into interactive design. Um, interactive design, uh, fantastic, fantastic field. Um, user experience is so hot right now, I really enjoyed being an experience designer. But I want, I want to tell you about this love-hate relationship I have with ex uh, interactive design. You've got to be wary of abstracted tools. Uh, they're not silver bullets. Now, I'm being a bit cynical here when I say patterns are intuitive, isolated, and repeatable. Unicorns are real. <laughs> because patterns change with context. Context and then the intent. That changes everything. A pattern is meant to be like, okay, the file save dialogue. You're gonna have a file save dialogue, it's gonna have uh, what you expect in almost every application. Sometimes the application will tweak it based on the context, like you know, the image format might be the file, site, file type that you save as, but you know, patterns don't necessarily dictate a complete success just because you've designed this one perfect thing in isolation. Patterns have to be considered in context. Uh, they are very useful, but uh, unicorns are real if you think patterns will solve all your problems. Wireframe, rapid, <laughs> okay, okay, this is terrible. I, I, was, this was, I was not in a good place. <laughs> Rapid prototypes, unencumbered by reality, welcome to the land of broken promises and snake oil. The problem with wireframes isn't wireframes. The problem is that people can, anyone can do a wireframe. And once it's done, it's held as this holy doctrine that everybody should follow. The consideration behind a wireframe has to match the ability to execute that. And when I mean match the ability to execute it, is the person who draws those rectangles has to know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> like, <laughs> Some people create a wireframe uh, for something that has a very good intent behind it, but they don't think about how the implementation detail is going to hammer out, and they don't necessarily think about all the other contexts, but then there's this holy document that you have to adhere to. Wireframes are a fantastic tool. I actually really like them, and I use them all the time, but you've got to trust who made it, and you've got to trust that, co that the consensus on a wireframe is real. Workflow. Okay. Uh, I proceed. <laughs> Kind of true. Now, writing, <laughs> writing down is good. Writing things down, documenting, making sure that you understand what you're talking about, and communicating ideas in a different medium helps you understand them completely. Using the term workflow is, is a bit of a, a loaded thing. I mean, if the task is obvious, you don't use the term workflow. Workflow, once that word, once that vocabulary gets introduced into the design agency world, uh, chances are they're trying to confuse you, chances are they don't really know what they're talking about, or chances are they're trying to make something really hard seem simple. Like it's a workflow, you know, don't worry about it. It's because uh, a workflow is a series of steps in order to produce a result or a series of steps that have a procedure in the middle to produce a result. And the sad thing is, is that sometimes workflows dismiss bad design. Tasks could be a lot simpler, but they're forgiven because it's a workflow. Um, that's not true. Workflows are a fantastic tool. I'm playing devil's advocate here. All right. Persona. 
a compromise for never meeting real stakeholders written by gamblers and liars. <laughs> that is true, snake oil. Um, always be wary of persona because you haven't got, you know, the, the problem isn't with a persona. Persona is a fantastic way to articulate your intended audience. You write it down, you keep it on your wall, you think about the intended persona. Often personas are real people, often it comes from real data, but so often it's just punting. If you read a persona document, you want to know whether or not that person comes from a set of data, whether or not they are in fact an actual real person, or whether or not the person that jammed about that is a trustworthy person. I mean, persona is this, uh, another holy grail of design that isn't the design in question, it's just an abstracted tool, it's just this abstract thing, it shouldn't be given so much weight. Uh, gamblers and liars, straight up. All right, so be wary of abstracted tools, but also, be wary of abstracted results. I mean, interactive design is this minefield. I always try and focus on the work, the real thing that you're doing, rather than all of these other, you know, meta terms around the real work. Um, analytics. <laughs> it's terrible because sometimes behavioral change takes a while. Sometimes, you know, analytics were set up before you got into the mix. Sometimes they punish you. I don't know one designer who feels really awesome when they're about to check in analytic on a major change. I mean, chances are they're freaking out. They're like, I know it was a good idea, but I just hope the data backs me up. Like, it is a, a minefield. Analytics are a very useful tool. In fact, uh, knowing um, how you measure things means you can actually see if you're successful. So measures of success, really, really good. Uh, I say metrics that justify slavery because sometimes they encumber good decisions simply because the numbers don't add up. But that's why you have instrumentation. The problem with instrumentation is you do it to yourself. Now, analytics I'm using in the broader sense that, you know, standard things you can check. Uh, instrumentation is where you actually implement uh, checking within what you're writing, specific to what you're writing, for what you're writing. That means you're creating your own slave rules. You're setting up your castle to know how it's going to be successful. A really, really useful thing. A really, really good tool. In fact, I, you know, you're flying blind if you don't do it. Um, but Again, you did it to yourself. So when your instrumentation starts returning uh, results that should have you change the design, you have to do a lot of soul searching because, uh, yeah, you did it to yourself. All right, surveys. Now, my, my wife is in um, market research and I think the industry provides great insight. I think it's a fantastic product. Um, <laughs> that's not, no, I, I really, my first job was in market research and it really does dig up honesty uh, in what you're trying to figure out, you know, every, everything from surveys to focus groups to, you know, cold calling random people when they're trying to have their dinner. Surveys, the board attention staff periphery of your audience. Kind of true, uh, you're not always going to get a great profile from a survey. Uh, you have to trust that you either have a homogenous market or that you aren't just grabbing a fringe. Sometimes there are vocal minorities, sometimes there are people with very serious problems that you'll never hear from because they just go away. So surveys don't answer everything. Again, these are results. These are not silver bullets. The design itself is the work. These are things that help you. And I advocate every single one of them here. I'm just being a bit cynical. Reviews. <laughs> um, if anyone's seen this XKCD, I don't want to put it up. Uh, Randall Munro's a champ. Uh, tornado warning app. Five and a half stars. <laughs> Fantastic. I can change the sound effect. Awesome. The themes are great. One star. Did not warn me about tornado. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes ratings are not exactly what they seem. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there are plenty of websites with five star products, but you just you have to read the text. You have to you know, truly trust, um, trust your reviews. A useful tool, but you've got to trust your, your data. All right, user testing. More like zombie testing. Why won't they smile? You could, <laughs> you could have the best interface. You could have the most engaging experience. You could have somebody on the edge of their seat in the realm that they absolutely love, and they're like this. And the videos are all the same. People are like, oh, oh, that's cool. We've seen people do some horrible, horrible things, being so nonchalant about it. It's like, you know, the world is failing around them and they're just like, oh cool, it's doing that. Sometimes user testing needs to be looked at more than just the surface level. Sometimes you have to look at the behavior, the intent, you know, the way that somebody did something. Uh, user testing is great, but don't look for smiles because you will never be fulfilled. <laughs> Why wouldn't this, if you show a picture of a cat though, they smile. It's <laughs> cheating, cheating. 
Uh, point is, have some fucking common sense. Um, there is no silver bullets in design. Uh, interactive design, still a you know emerging field. There's still a lot of really uh, great data, really great patterns, really great behaviour. Uh, sometimes we're designing for people that have uh, pre you know pre-existing knowledge. We have to know that we're aware of that. aware of that. Lots of other contexts at which we have to consider. Interactive design is awesome. One thing I love: progressive disclosure. Simple rule. Uh, do I need to show it yet? Um, is it cool to show it later? Show it later. Um, you know, Edward Tuft has this like data density thing and I'm buying into that. That's just like, yes, if you're used to seeing the same thing every single day, you know what tiny little rivet to look at. But if it's your first impression, progressive disclosure. Form follows function, hear it a lot. Industrial designers rock that every day. Um, form follows function, you just think about what it should do and you try and make it look like it's capable of doing that so people trust you. Affordance, now here's a great example. You think about, I actually hate this component. I like loathe this component because like, it's got this tiny little contact point. You think that just the, you know, some people when you see it in videos, they, you know, try and touch that little end bit. You know, and the hit target, you, you, it's like a skew, it's a skew morph, really. They, they try and hit the hit target on the very end. Sometimes they miss, sometimes you have to make the hit target too big so you have like a really bad area for, for contact. But what this, what this um, component does is it forgives the exact value. On the very left, you've got an input of an exact value and the person doing the uh, entering will actually consider exact values like 15.5 or 75.6, you know, whatever else. But if you give them a, a, a dial that has an affordance of a very gestural uh, measure, then if you're in a DJ app, people start listening to the volume rather than thinking about the uh, actual value. So that's an interesting way that you can you know, hack people's uh, input, hack people's behavior of how they input to get away from, you know, the really neurotic, like exactly this amount type, because sometimes that doesn't give them, um, you know, what they want. Uh, so I'm going to cover one thing. It's a loaded thing, but I'm going to do the difference between hyperrealism and skewmorphism, only because these are terms that people name drop all the time. They're like, "Oh, you're a designer. Skewmorphs suck." <laughs> <laughs> And that is not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, it's a very useful, uh, very useful tool. But I'll just cover hyperrealism. It's when you apply a series of environmentals onto something to make it look real, to make it look native to the environment, to make it look like it belongs. Hyperrealism makes it, things look real, funnily enough. It's not hard to get. Skeuomorphism reminds you of something real. It's intended to remind you, not to actually look like something real, but just to remind you. It doesn't have to be a high fidelity thing. Um, if you were going to invent a new measure of time, you would probably put it on a clock or a watch or some kind of environment to explain without explaining, this is a new measure of time. This is, you know, how the Klingons rock it out or this is how the Kardashians read time, like different stuff. <laughs> so that was interactive design. Easy as. Oh, press B. I'm going to go on to experience design, which is like, it's fantastic. I love that this is a field. It's so good. Uh, because again, you see all the people going like this in the videos, and then you're like, experience design? Like, honestly, they. First rule of <laughs> experience design deliberate differences. This is a terrible tiger. It is probably the worst tiger I have ever seen. It couldn't do half of the stuff that tigers do. It's terrible. It's a pretty cute dog, though, you know? <laughs> Deliberate differences, uh, they're a really important thing. Um, marketing people call this positioning, repositioning, depositioning. Uh, Don Draper calls it changing the conversation. It's uh, all about defying and denying comparison to something to avoid disappointment of your audience. I'll give you a brief anecdote. Uh, when Red Hat Linux 9 was released on the back, we had Open Office, the GIMP, and a new icon set. Now, most of the customers for Red Hat Linux 9 give zero shits about that functionality. But you didn't see that stuff on Solaris, you didn't see that stuff on Windows, you didn't see that stuff mentioned anywhere else. We were something new. We had other things. We were something to discover. We defied and denied comparison to avoid disappointment. People found out why Linux was good. People found out why it was useful. They just got past that surface of comparison to realize where the true good aspects were. And that's really important. If you, if you feel like you're not measuring up to somewhere else, you've got to defy and deny comparison. Absolutely, all the time. And I don't mean, we're not that, we're more like this. I mean, actually, at an obvious level, be something different. Shitty tiger, cute dog. Also, empathy is a product now, you know? Um, taking ownership builds trust. Um, it's kind of, you know, forgiveness and support. You can get away with a lot as long as you act like, you know, you're sorry. <laughs> or as long as you act like, uh, you know, you, you own the problem. So I'm, 
unofficially, officially the Inkscape apologist. Uh, all the time. People come to me like, when is there going to be a Mac non-X11 thing? Or when is it going to support all of the XML features for SVG? And I just, I'm the official apologist. I have to say sorry. I have to direct the best effort to what code matters, what needs to be changed. Or I have to either say, well, it can't do that, but it can do this. To, to try and lead people down the road of knowing that this is a problem we have. We acknowledge it. We take ownership. It's probably going to be there for a while. But the empathy doesn't discourage people. It uh, invites them in. It builds trust. It gets more people going. So, so think something, make it, then become. You've got to uh, become what you create. You cannot throw a baby in the ocean. It is illegal. I looked it up. <laughs> no kids. Hoping to have kids. All right, so that was, um, that was my, little, my little spiel. But I want, I want you to nail the hierarchy of needs. Here's some more stuff that I made up. Now, this guy called Maslow, you're all like, oh, God, fucking Maslow. If you know who Maslow, if you know who Maslow is, he's like the guy that said we all, we all need, you know, like sex before food or something. I can't remember the exact details, but like, <laughs> we all, let's be honest, we all would have been dead long ago. <laughs> but but he, he, he defined it as a hierarchy. And the only reason why I'm... I'm adding this um, is because this guy like Aaron Walter, really cool guy, wrote uh, Designing for Emotion, uh, cool book, check it out. He wrote this, um, you know, uh, emotive needs, you know, function, reliability, usability, pleasure. And that was his pyramid. Um, I decided that wasn't good enough. It was good, but not good enough. And I decided for the sake of me trying to take ownership of, you know, the idea so that I could articulate it properly, I had to write my own. And I came up with big six. These big six are really crazy important. I call them the hierarchy of needs um, for UX, but they're actually not a hierarchy at all, whatsoever. They're a list. They're something that you just, like, aim a shotgun at and try like hell to hit. Like, you really, you, you absolutely, if you do half of these, you are 100% successful. You are a god amongst people. You are just a, you know, an amazing success story. If you hit more than half, like what were you eating, ambrosia? It is amazing. Like just look at these: lovable, loyal, trusted. Like who gets that from an app or something? Like really? Um, I put them here because of the undertones of survival. I put them next to Maslow because there is that undertone of you know we need these things. There is a survival aspect to what you create, needing to have hit a majority of these needs or as many as possible. Uh, but they're also uh, paired well with the elements and principles simply because there's the easy to observe, uh, the things like convenient, easy, logical, predictable, reliable, accessible, purposeful, and functional. And they're also, there's the hard to tell, the things that you may never even know that you've reached. You know, you might have a punt, have an idea, you might have a guess, you might gauge it in conversations or hear it in the periphery circles of, you know, your feedback loop or whatever. You, you don't necessarily know whether or not you've hit all of these, but it is important to aim like hell at all of them. It's damned hard to hit them all. Um, we got lovable, loyal, trusted, purposeful, functional, like it's, you can get away with not having many of these, including functional. <laughs> you have no idea how I've installed there's a conglomerate XML editor for Docbook. I installed that thing like every month for like three years, hoping that it would start working. <laughs> because it offered something uh, and it had a good enjoyable interf you know, interface for what was at the time something good. Um, it, it, it hit a lot of needs for me. What I want you to consider for a moment is um, all of those semi-permanent, shitty, you know, click and destroy uh, ad, you know, those games that get bought for millions of dollars, mostly by like Zigner and crap like that. They are, they're terrible. They are scum of the earth, like really bad stuff. But they hit most of these with their audience. It's amazing. You're playing uh, words with friends and you've got, you know, somebody you like, somebody you trust on the other end. Uh, it, you know, does the job of connecting you across the network. Um, you know, it is delightful when somebody does a really, you know, creative word combination. Uh, meaningful and personal, well, the person on the other end who you're associated with might make it meaningful. That you actually have a driver for hitting a whole lot of these needs. And that's why they can justify, maybe, I don't know why they can justify so much cash, but this is a serious reason why there is so much value in that type of design. Despite how much you might not like it, if you hit so many of these, you are definitely a success, no matter what it is you're making. Absolutely believe that. All right, now I'm going to run into the process. That was my like things that I know about design, but I'm in marketing now, so I can forget it. 
people think about the product of design. They go, this is so well designed, this is so cool, but rarely people think about the process, even though they are one and the same. People really don't think about how something came to be, they just think about it as being, like it would manifest into the world as a gift of great design. It just doesn't happen like that. Good design is a process. I'm going to do the design thinking thing, uh, IDEO, D-Lab, you know, all that sort of stuff. If you are groaning right now because it's been baked, it has been done. This thing has been talked and workshopped and a million little TED Talks and whatever else. It's just one of those things that people are like, I'm going to implement organizational change. We'll all do design thinking. Not exactly, but I want to... I want to I want to just cover it because I use it every single day and I don't use it in this year long, you know, changing the entire structure of our company type process. I use it as a reality check, just like I use the elements and principles of design. I use it really quick to check myself before I wreck myself. I change the terminology because I think that words like ideation are, you know, a bit silly. Like if I say that to somebody, I feel like a, you know, a bit of a dickhead because it's like, hey, let's ideate on that for a while. It doesn't sound good, you know? I know, I know. Um, all right, I'm going to run through them. These are actually designed to be going through real quick. Define, see, name, articulate your problem. Find, figure out what you need. So you've got to research like hell. Guess, have a crack at it. Get your friends to have a crack at it. Um, brainstorm like crazy. Dismiss no ideas. Oh, dude, that is me. <laughs> all right, come on, almost done, almost done. All right, uh, try it out. Check something, review and combine the good ideas that worked. Uh, actually do it. That's really important to actually do stuff. You can't talk about it forever. Um, get feedback, document, and track it. Drink beer, fist pump, don't be a smug douche. <laughs> and if you want it to like the Daft Punk thing, you know, know it, find it, guess it, try it, check it, finish it, learn lots from it. Uh, it's <laughs> really, no kidding, I actually do that in my head. That is how broken I am when I'm thinking about a problem. Uh, failing at life is helps you design. Uh, the best designers I know can't open doors, Walk into poles, really, walk into poles. Uh, burn themselves with coffee all of the time. Don't read signs. Uh, they're terrible, terrible, terrible. It's just life. You know, I fail at life so many times. I'm such a klutz. But knowing these things and catching these things helps you uh, accommodate them before other people. And failing at life makes great designers. You don't have to be autistic or anything like that. You just have to fail at life. Very simple to do. Just get really drunk the night before. Try and do normal things the next day. Um, I made you a poster, but first I'm going to cover some books to buy. Uh, this guy, screw this, this guy's such a... I read this book like two nights ago, and I'm like, that's all the stuff in my talk. He took it all. That's terrible. <laughs> and then I'm like, wait, they should just read that book because they're not going to remember everything from my talk. Design for Hackers is a fantastic book. If you can stomach the Apple worship and that chapter about Web 2.0, everything else is gold. It is beautiful gold. Um, I really, no, the book is, the book is, you know, like, it's what I don't even have to think about writing. It's a fantastic book. It's pragmatic. Uh, it gives a good summary. Uh, it does, you know, explain a lot of complex concepts. The other one is Pragmatic Thinking, Learning, Refactor Your Wetware. If you've heard of this book, hands up if you've read this book. All right, it's like a marathon read. It's great. It's deep into psychology and interactive design. It is a wicked, awesome thing. You will become, un it's like going to uh, one of those Scientology things. You'll be changed. <laughs> Whole bunch of other books, Book Apart, Rainbow of Knowledge, Smashing Books, John Hicks, Icon Handbook, Stephen Heller. Heller. Do you know what? He doesn't have an e-book? Like, honestly, what, how's that for accessible? I don't even buy dead trees anymore. Like, 100 Ideas That Change Graphic Design is a good book. Go to a library and read it. It's nice. Donald Norman, uh, Emotional Design, and HTML Issues. All right, we're done. I will be at the pub, uh, the Wigan Pen, from 7 p.m. onwards. Uh, it's a mini bucks party for me. I'm getting married. <laughs> Feel free to buy me a beer. Um, <laughs> this is a poster that you can go to, uh, ndfits.com slash poster PDF, and that's the actual presentation I just delivered. If you want to hash it over again, there's some speaker's notes in there, and I'm going to add the WebKit prefixes. I'm sorry, um, you know, because I just hacked the CSS real quick. Uh, but yeah, the poster is what I print out, and you just check your problems off. You pretty much circle and check elements and principles, the design thinking process, and what you can, you know, uh, change and mix with, and uh, that helps me understand a problem. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that, Andy. Um, I don't think I'll ever look at another wife frame drawing the same way again. Um, <coughs> we'd like to present you with this uh, gift. And thank you for um, presenting here. Thank you.
Thank you very much. effect on the noise, maybe I'll boost the Is volume the on the desk. On no, there's no volume. It's not that I can see. Less behind that panel. Yeah, sometimes I have the volume. What model is that? Doubt it. I think it's probably just batteries. batteries. 